Good morning. Um, my name is Sarah Sigmund, and I wanted to introduce myself to you because I don't work here, so you might not know me. Um, I, put a, I, I have a slide with a picture of my family. Um, my husband does work here. His name is Jonathan Sigmund. He's the executive pastor. And these are our kids. They are in kindergarten and second grade. I'm a public school teacher. I've been teaching for 14 years, and I've gone to church here for 16 years. I have a couple hobbies, like most people. I like cooking, I like reading, and I like decorating. And um, part of knowing me is receiving unsolicited book recommendations, so here are some. This is my favorite cookbook from this year that I used quite a bit. It's called Super Simple by Half-Baked Harvest. And then my favorite decorating book is called Cozy Minimalist by an uh, author named Mike Will and Smith, who I really like. So there you go. You can add it to your Amazon cart if you have any last-minute shopping to do for anyone else who also likes cooking and decorating. So um, the fact that I like decorating and rearranging and redecorating will occasionally lead me to stores um, you've probably seen, such as At Home or Hobby Lobby or My Promised Land is Marshall's. And I can wander the aisles, and they have sections of the store that are like wall art. You know, your decorations that get hung like art. But there's been a trend in the last 10 years where some of the wall art is trying to give me advice. And it will say things like, be awesome today, or live more, worry less, choose adventure. Here's one. Positive thinking equals positive outcome. Listen, I know what you're trying to say, but the math on that does not always check out. So we have none of these at our house because I do not like being bossed around by my wall art. Wall art, you do not know my day. But I get it, and I know why that stuff is selling. And it's not just that it's cute. It's the idea that we do feel the need for some kind of inspiration and some kind of encouragement because things are sometimes really tragic and really exhausting and really discouraging. Merry Christmas. But the Bible offers a very different gift than a $8.99 wall canvas that's meant to lift you back up. When you're discouraged and you're struggling, the Bible is offering you the gift of the kind of endurance that comes from Jesus, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start by looking at the text. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It'll be on the screen. You can also look it up on um, your phone or if you brought your Bible. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted." So Hebrews is my favorite book of the Bible. I actually just finished a fall Bible study on it, which means that some of the girls sitting in this room listened to me teach on the book of Hebrews for seven weeks in a row, and they are therefore dismissed for coffee now if they would like some. But the placement of um, that section I just read you is the beginning of chapter 12, but it's actually a conclusion of chapter 11. Chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews is a short essay about a group of people who lived their lives with significant faith in God and what God did through their lives. And it spans all the way back to the days of Adam and Noah. And the last people that are mentioned at the end of Hebrews 11 would be contemporaries of this author of the book of Hebrews. And they were people who were really suffering. People who it says they were being murdered, they were being imprisoned, they were living in poverty, they were being mocked. But God was still working in their lives through their faith. And that leads up to what we just read. That's why it starts with a therefore. It comes from that place of God's involvement through people's faith in the midst of suffering, or what I affectionately call the real world, where we know that you can't expect a happy ending all the time, even if you do believe in God. And so therefore, what am I supposed to do with that? So he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight 
and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So that sentence, which has like 19 commas, also has two um, verbs, two action phrases. So you can take a third grade teacher out of a classroom, but she's still gonna talk about parts of speech. So there's two verbs in there, and the first one talks about laying aside, um, laying aside your sin, the weight that clings to you so closely. So when I was younger, I played a computer game called um, Oregon Trail. Does anybody remember that? I thought it was a video game. I had a lot of friends. And um, Oregon Trail was a, de a game designed to give you information and experiences that mimicked the pioneers who were leaving their homes in the East and moving out West in the 1800s. This is like go West young man, manifest destiny, all of that stuff if you're familiar with it. So these individuals had this dream that they were gonna move out to where there would be more freedom, more opportunity, more land. They packed up their wagons, that was how they got there, with their most precious and necessary things from their lives back east. If you were playing the computer game, we could buy like barrels of flour, uh, food for your oxen, you could get medicine, it didn't matter, you were gonna get dysentery. But for the real people who actually, you know, were, were actually moving in the 1800s, they set out with their most precious and necessary items on what they called wagon trains, which were caravans, and headed for their new life. But historians tell us that along the path, along the trails that they followed, they found all of these heavy abandoned treasures, like pianos, Furniture, heavy wood chests, books. And interestingly, they found a lot of bacon, which is apparently very heavy. And that tells you that the Sigmunds wouldn't have gotten very far because I would not have thrown out the books and Jonathan would not have thrown out the bacon and we'd have gone home. <laughs> but, but these people on their journey, they wanted to get where they were going more than they wanted to hold on to something that just a few days before they had deemed precious and necessary and part of their very identity. But when it came down to choosing, I will carry this or I will get to the place I believe I've been made to go, they laid it down. And the author of Hebrews is saying that it's our sin that's weighing us down, that's the heavy thing. So sin is a Christian vocabulary word that we use in the Bible to describe my thoughts, my actions and my motivations that are unhealthy, that are destructive to me and to other people, and that are unlike the holy nature of God. And when we talk about sin and we have conversations about sin, it can feel really heavy. Like the Bible's trying to put something on me, like some really clunky burden that I'm gonna have to manage now. But do you see that what the author is saying is actually the complete opposite? It's our sin that's heavy on us. It's our sin that's the burden. The ways that I'm unlike God is what's making it harder for me. Laying aside my sin actually gives me more energy and more strength and ultimately more endurance. And I can prove it because I am a sinner. So one sin that comes up a lot in the Bible, not necessarily in the church, but a lot in the Bible is pride. Um, in James 4, 6, it says, but he gives more grace. That is why scripture said, God opposed the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Proverbs eleven two 2 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. So pride is one of the sins that I have faced down over and over. And I can tell you that when I'm losing that, and when there's pride in my heart and in my mind, it weighs me down. It is exhausting to spend my time considering what other people are thinking of me and trying to manage their opinion of me, trying to make them somehow aware of the things I'm doing well and of my strengths, while at the same time keeping them completely ignorant of all the ways I'm dropping the ball and all the things I'm bad at. It's exhausting. And then I can even get mad, I get angry, if I feel like I'm not getting credit for the things I'm doing that I deserved. And now I'm exhausted and I'm angry. So tell me, who has more energy and joy? Who can go farther? A proud person or a humble one? It's my sin that weighs me down. Sin is an extra drain on our hearts and our mind in a world that is already sometimes draining. And that's why the author of Hebrews is encouraging the reader to lay it aside. Now, unloading a piano from a wagon 
involves a few strong people and a heave-ho. But the process of laying aside your sin, that's a spiritual process. We have another vocabulary word for it. It's called um, repentance. And it's just a process that you go through, that Christians go through daily. And it involves the steps of confession, of honestly owning to God, to yourself, sometimes to the person you hurt, what you did. Asking for God to give you that forgiveness and then accepting the forgiveness and the new start, the fresh chance. Um, one verse that we talk about a lot in church is in 1 John 1, 9, because it, just, it is the steps of that process. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the fresh start. So this is that process that we walk through to lay aside our sins so that it's not weighing us down anymore. And then the second verb phrase was to run with endurance. Endurance, for our purpose this morning, I'm going to talk about endurance as the ability to withstand hardship or adversity, the ability to sustain a prolonged, stressful effort or activity. It's over the distance. Does that sound familiar to you? Does that describe any aspect of your life at work? Or does that does that fit a relationship you have with a family member or a friend? Does that fit the tension in the situation in your home? Or how you feel about a health issue that won't resolve? See, endurance isn't the gift we want. It is the gift we need. It's like the socks and underwear of spiritual gifts. We want the resolution, or, or we want a happy ending, or at the very least, we want an answer for what happened. But the author of Hebrews lived in the same world that you and I do, and he was telling the truth. When he says to his author or to his readers to run with endurance, it's not like cliche wall art. It's a deep spiritual encouragement for you to lean into the endurance that comes from faith in Jesus. Because endurance, as it turns out, that's actually the attitude and the character trait that you need to live a life of faith in a really broken world. We want it to be magical and twinkly and everything to be okay. But the gift we really need is the kind of endurance that comes from Jesus when it's not okay. And that brings us back because a gift comes from somewhere. That's what makes it a gift. And this gift, like all good gifts, comes from Jesus. So back to Hebrews 12, we're going to go back to verse 2. It says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Look at Jesus. This section describes Jesus as the founder of our faith, of our Christian faith. So the founder of something, the founder of a business, is the one who comes up with the vision, the one who builds it, the one who sets up the systems. This is the beginning. This is um, This is Christmas. This is Jesus incarnate, Emmanuel, God in the manger, in human form. This is Jesus, who is the founder of our faith and the teacher of a whole new way to live. Mm -mm. (laughs) Sorry, bud. See you in a couple minutes. (laughs) That's my brother. This is Jesus, the founder of and the teacher of a whole new way to live. Jesus taught about a whole new way to love your neighbors to a whole new depth. Jesus taught us um, a new and better understanding of who is God and what is sin and where do we find forgiveness. When you're tired, go back and read the Gospels and look at Jesus, the founder of your faith, and see who you see there. This is where it starts. But then it goes on to the perfecter of our faith. And see, that's the cross, that's Easter. Jesus is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. This is the sacrifice of love that would lead someone to die a physically painful death listening to untrue accusations. 
It's the deepest and most sincere demonstration of love this world has ever seen, and that's why people can't forget about it and still talk about it. And then from there, it becomes the moment that Jesus defeated the deepest and enemy of humanity, which was death, by his resurrection and the promise of ours. That's the perfection of our faith. When you are tired, consider the perfect work of Jesus. And look at Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of your faith. The author of Hebrews actually does not tell you to look inside yourself to find your strength. Because I, and anyone who's very, very honest, will tell you that there's a horrifying moment where you will go to look inside yourself and either it will be empty, or even worse, it will be ugly. Looking inside myself is not enough when I'm really, really tired and discouraged. I have to look at Jesus. See, we endured because Jesus endured. What was Jesus looking at? Well, the text says Jesus was looking at heaven, at the reconciliation of God to humanity. He looked at that because he knew what was coming. When I'm tired, I look at Jesus. So I'm gonna bring you back to the whole text so you can hear it together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility so that you may not grow faint, grow weary or faint-hearted. So when we talked about this text in our Bible study, we talked about the um, Olympics. So we love the Olympics. Like our family has this massive spurt of patriotism every like 18 to 32 months or however often it comes up. And we will watch anything. We throw out all our screen time rules and we have the coverage on all day, and we will watch ping pong and speed walking. That was a little weird. But like most people, we wait for like swimming, track and field, and gymnastics. That's the good stuff. And and track and field especially, um, it's just so fun to watch. But that, this section reminded me of the Olympics. This one less so because the stands were empty but of the track and field events at the Olympics, when it talks about being surrounded, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, for the experience for the athlete, when they're surrounded by people who are encouraging them and cheering them on in what they're trying to do, that is what your faith community is. You are surrounded by so great a group of people living now, running with you, and the stories that you find in scripture and throughout Christian history of people who have experienced the goodness of God as they lived by faith, that's meant to be encouraging. And it talks about laying aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. You know, when those people run, their uh, outfits, the sports people tell me it's called uniforms, their, um, their clothes, there's like not a lot going on there. But it's not meant to show off. I mean, they look good, you do you. But it's not meant to show off. Those things are designed to not weigh them down. Like there's nothing flapping in the wind in those track uniforms because they were designed to help them be effective in their race. They're not carrying anything they don't need to carry, anything that would slow them down. Now here's where the analogy breaks down a little bit because for the Olympian, they know exactly where their finish line is and that's what they're looking at. Um, you know, and they can pace themselves and know where they need to be at what time to finish when they want to. But I don't know where my finish line is. I don't know where it is for the situations that I'm frustrated with right now, like when those situations are gonna resolve. I don't even know where my finish line is for my time on this earth. So I'm not looking at a finish line. It says for me to look to Jesus to get the strength I need to keep going. When school started this September, I teach third grade for uh, reference. When school started this September, it was really best described as a dumpster fire. We brought these kids back to school for full-time learning five days a week. They hadn't done that in a really long time. They had forgotten some really complicated things like sitting up. Um, And the whole month of September was 
exhausting. And I love my job. My job doesn't usually make me tired at all, but I kept coming home so tired after work. And I kept saying to John, I'm not going to make it till June. I can't do this till June. I can't do this till June. I'm not going to make it till June. And we had to have a mindset shift, me, Jonathan, and the Holy Spirit, where, where I stopped thinking about June. And I started waking up in the morning and praying for the Holy Spirit to give me some kind of creativity and patience for that day. In case you're wondering about my class, they really turned the ship around and they're awesome now. But that was rough. And, and we had a big, a big shift where it went from, I'm not gonna make it to June, to I'm gonna pray for the strength and the creativity and the patience for today to be faithful with what, what I have to do. Because when you're looking at June, you start to get paralyzed. But when you're looking at Jesus, I'll tell you what you see. When you look at Jesus, you will see unconditional love even when you are the one who messed it up. When you're looking at Jesus, you actually do get a fresh start every day. The Bible refers to it as new mercy. When you're looking at Jesus, you can actually have hope for a better future because you're not doomed to repeat what has already happened. And when you're looking at Jesus, you can actually experience the forgiveness, the weight lifted from what you did. And when that's what you're looking at, you can keep going. And that's called endurance. So this might not seem like a very Christmassy message, but I think it is. My um, grandma Gloria said, well, my grandma Gloria said a lot of things. Most of them were right and most of them can't be repeated in church. (laughs) But this one can. My grandma Gloria told me that it is a myth that old people are nice. She said, when you get old, you will become more of what you already were. So if you were already a nice person, you will become very sweet. If you were already nasty, you will be extra bitter and mean. She was usually right about things. But you know what? Christmas is the same thing. If you are already full of joy and things are wonderful and happy right now, it is extra sparkly and glittery. But if you were already feeling the strain of a really tough relationship, that's more stressful right now. If you were already missing somebody, it hurts worse this time of year. If you're already discouraged because your body can't keep up with what your mind wants to do, that's even more frustrating now that there's a lot of activities and the days are busy around the holidays. And if you're already feeling that pain that comes from the consequence of bad choices, yours, someone else's, that's extra bitter right now. If your family's struggling with finances, and having a hard time making ends meet, Christmas can really add a sense of shame and frustration to that. So you see what I mean when I say endurance isn't the Christmas gift you want, but it is the one you need. See, we ask for and even accept lesser gifts, things that can't actually give you the kind of endurance and patience and strength that comes from the Holy Spirit. There is no option, no strategy, no change you're going to make in your life that is going to come close to comparing to the presence of Jesus in your life. There's nothing and no one that you can trust or lean on that is as strong as Jesus. There's no one who can understand you and encourage you like the one who made you and is walking with you. There's no new hobby you're gonna pick up and no fun night out you're gonna have or no amount of extra sleep that is gonna pour back into your heart every morning the kind of strength and patience that you need to stay in your race. Jesus does that. And that's the gift he's offering to us. So spiritual knowledge is unique in that it only holds value when it makes the sink from your head down to your heart. So our Christmas gift to you is that we're going to have these nice music people play some quiet music so that you can have a couple minutes to pray. And in your heart, look at Jesus. Give Jesus the hard and the heavy and the discouraged thoughts that you have and leave space for him to give back to you 
the kind of patience and energy that you need. Give to Jesus where you feel weary and faint-hearted and discouraged, and let him give back to you what he already knows you need.